Um, I'm Professor Martinez. I teach here in the Urban Studies Department of Social Science. Um, welcome to our teach-in about Amazon coming to Long Island City. Um, this is our second panel of the day, so I think most people are just coming in for this hour. I think most people were not here for the first hour. The first hour was uh, some background on the Long Island City waterfront and the impact um, on Long Island City uh, around jobs and housing and infrastructure that Amazon, the kind of pressures that Amazon would put on our city, but specifically on Long Island City. Um, so I'm going to be the moderator, I'm going to be doing the introductions, but also um, I want to kind of just, because I am, I do wear two hats in my life, one is as a professor, the other is as a community organizer and activist um, with the organization Queens Neighborhoods United, which is where I'm our little pen, and this is um, LJ, who is a student here at LaGuardia. Um, and the two of us are going to talk a little bit about what we think about Amazon and specifically what we think about Amazon and how it impacts the lives of LaGuardia students, okay? So, um, just for starters, raise your hand if you um, have shopped at Whole Foods in the last month. Okay. Raise, keep your, no, keep your hands in the air. Raise your hands if you have bought anything off of Amazon in the past month. Okay. Ray, keep your hands in the air. Keep your hands in the air. Raise your hands if you have watched anything on Amazon Prime or ordered anything off of Amazon Prime TV show wise or whatever movies. Uh huh. Okay, now look around the room. So almost every hand is in the air, right? So we are all implicated in this, okay? This is, it's not like Amazon exists over there and like we're over here and we're divorced from it, right? We are all deeply, how many people are Amazon Prime members? Uh-huh, yeah, me too, right? So we are all implicated in this system. And so it's gonna be hard to resist something that we are implicated in. So that's one of the things we're gonna talk about. So that even if you love getting your books or movies or whatever, or diapers quickly from Amazon, Right? Doesn't mean that you. That it doesn't make you a hypocrite if you don't want the new Amazon headquarters to come here to Long Island City. You can both order things off of Amazon and still hate on Amazon. Okay? You can order things off of Amazon and still resist it coming here and whitewashing and destroying our city. Right? Okay. So first off, the, the number one reason that we are against this project, this new headquarters, is around the issue of rents, rising rents, and the impact it's going to have on housing. LJ is going to talk a little bit about her personal experience here as a student living in Queens and, and her experience of housing. Yes, so um, I think most of the students here at LaGuardia live in Queens and maybe like Long Island City or Jackson Heights or um, Woodside. So I myself, I live in an SRO. It's a single, uh, single room occupancy, which is a little space and shared with three people. And I'm paying $700 for my rent. And before I moved to this apartment, I was actually displaced because my previous landlord increased the rent for $100. So I moved to this new apartment, which is the same apartment, really tiny, it's very small space, and I'm paying $700. And guess what? My landlord last week asked me to pay for another $50 for the, for the heater systems because it's winter. And imagine like my room is really, uh, it's, it's, it's really small. It's, um, the, the entire floor is like this and it's shared with three people and only a single wall that actually divided us. And we share the same bathroom. Imagine I wake up 4 a.m. in the morning and I have to pee, but I can't because someone is using the, using the bathroom, which is really awful. So how many students here say that they're suffering from something that urban studies professors call urban, call housing insecurity? Meaning that in the last year, maybe your family had, has had to move, or the landlord, put your hands in the air, or maybe the landlord has been threatening a rent increase, or maybe you're living in between housing, like you're crashing with some friends or cousins or whatever because you can't afford a place, or you're in the shelter system, right? A lot of CUNY students are in the shelter system or homeless or have housing insecurity. So that's the number one way that we think that the Amazon headquarters is gonna directly impact CUNY students, is through the rising rents and putting increased pressure on housing that we all are experiencing. The second, can I say something else? Yeah, um, I think we're in a city where it's one of the wealthiest cities in the United States, and 
We have 65,000 people, homeless families in New York City. And NYCHA, which is the New York um, Housing Authority, is in debt, which is 32, 32 million, million in debt. And um, most, of our, most of our communities, our neighbors live in hazardous buildings, um, threatened by landlords, is what uh, Professor Anna said. And, and uh, the government is actually giving tax breaks for $3 billion. And why are we doing this? This is one of the wealthiest company in the world. Uh, according to Time.com, Bezos is earning more than uh, almost $4,000 every second. And why is New York State giving that tax break to this company? Yeah, so the second thing that we think is a problem about the Amazon headquarters is uh, this question of jobs, right? And the kind of 25,000 um, tech jobs and how that's gonna be good for the city, et cetera, et cetera. When we know, like anybody who does any research on Amazon knows that Amazon is notoriously bad, it's a notoriously bad employer. Both in their tech jobs, people are suicidal, they're crying at their desks, right? They, they cannot hold their workers for more than a year. And it's a very transient workforce, right? And generally they do not hire from the places that they locate, right? So it's probably not gonna be like New Yorkers or CUNY students getting these jobs. They import their workers from other cities and they tend to be majority white men, right? Um, the other thing is the, the warehouse jobs. They're not unionized. Um, and there, you know, you hear these stories, right? Of people peeing in bottles because they're not allowed to take breaks, especially around the holidays. Extremely stressful work. Um, so, how many people here? Oh, and the other thing is, of course, Amazon kills small businesses, right? We know all the time that Amazon is putting small businesses out of business because increasingly we just order everything to our doors. So, how many people here work in a small business, or their family owns a small business, or you're somehow connected to a small business in Queens? Yeah, that's right. So I'd say about a third of the people in the audience. So LJ is going to talk a little bit really quickly about an experience with a small business in Queens. Yes, so um, I'm part of the Queens Neighborhoods United, and I've done a lot of outreach and talked to small businesses in my neighborhood, especially specifically Jackson Heights. And one of the business that, is actually, that was actually displaced uh, a couple of months ago is a business called uh, May, May May. This business is a family-owned business. Um, the owners are from China. They, they immigrated to the United States uh, uh, two decades ago, and then they started this business for almost a decade. Now what happened is that in Jackson Heights, Target is actually going to come. And so the landlord who owns the property told the business owner that they're going to raise because of the real estate speculation, meaning that, you know, um, the Amazon, I mean, Target is coming to Jackson Heights and there's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be gentrified. So the landlord is asking them to, to, to increase the rent. And so this small business, this is a 99 cent store. So the business obviously cannot keep up with the rent. So they ended up losing their business and they are displaced. Imagine if this, uh, this particular business holds five employees, which is from the community. And um, having this business for 10 years and being displaced is very awful. Exactly. Okay, and the very last thing in terms of the Amazon is, have people heard about Amazon and their um, collaboration and connection to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, known as ICE? Have people heard about this? So Amazon is a, is a contractor with ICE, um, and that's another reason that um, we as individuals, but also as members of this organization, Queens Neighborhoods United, that is a... Um, you know, we do anti-gentrification work in Queens, but also we're a very pro-immigrant rights organization. And so any corporation that collaborates with ICE, in our opinion, is like a terrorist organization when it comes to thinking about our communities of color and immigrant communities in Queens, right? So LJ is going to talk a little bit about that and how that impacts students. Yes, so um, how many of you here have friends who are um, undocumented or international students? Raise your hands. Well, obviously this is, this is one of the most diverse schools in the United States. And the student body here comes from different backgrounds. Um, regardless of our immigration status, this institution is very welcoming with different kind of students. And why would we support this kind of business if this, is, this business threatens our, um, our student body, our diversity here? 
Okay, the last thing, because in the interest of time, I just want LJ to get a chance to say one more thing before I throw it over to our speakers. Um, so, of all the students here, do you think that your voice matters as a student of LaGuardia Community College? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you think your voice has to be heard? Yes. Yes, yes right. So, I want to share to you something about the website. So, on the LaGuardia website, there is a welcome note that welcomes Amazon to Queens. And I'm going to read it to you according to what it says. It says, We're very proud that LaGuardia was a key player in the proposal process to bring Amazon here. And the New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, has said that LaGuardia's diverse and talented students were a big bus for LIC. Amazon, welcome to LIC. That's what it says. Do you think that this general statement represents the entire student body of LaGuardia? Do you think the statement represents the entire opinion of all the students here? No. 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 And it's actually on the website. So LJ and myself and the faculty and the student organizers of this teach-in just want to make you aware that this is happening and that the college is welcoming Amazon with open arms. And we encourage you all to join community groups, CUNY student activist groups, and to start to push back against this and to see it as part of something that is integrated and impact, impacting your lives and not something that's just happening over there, right? So, um, okay, now, thank you so much, LJ. Let's give her a round of applause. Now I'm going to switch gears back into my professor um, hat and welcome our speakers today. So our first speaker is Jonathan Bailey from the Queens Democratic Socialists of America, known as DSA. Um, Jonathan is a me the member coordinator for the Queens branch of DSA. He worked on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's successful 2008 campaign for U.S. Congress. I think a lot of people know who she is, right? She's like a local celebrity now. Um, and, uh, and he's also a member of the Queen's Anti-Gentrification Project. Go ahead. Hey, everyone. Okay. I'm super nervous because I'm not actually a pro. Um, so, um, I've been kind of uh, asked uh, to talk a little bit about what work on on the on the ground level, kind of looks like at the moment, and um, just kind of maybe give uh, everybody kind of a better sense for like the the territory that we're we're kind of playing in. So um, the story of all of this actually starts um, much earlier than than now, um, and also earlier than maybe uh, like a year ago. You know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, you know our politicians asking. Uh, and you know, actually buying for Amazon to come. The story actually really starts with um, all of these uh, empty towers that we're seeing um, in Long Island City. So originally, the plan for all of that was that all of that was going to be um, like no, none of that was going to be residential. That was supposed to be commercial space. Um, and so when the original plans for uh, developing Long Island City, as we see now, um, were actually created, the whole idea was that there would be a lot of office space, um, and this wasn't going to be, uh, you know, uh, empty apartment buildings. Well, what ended up happening was instead of it being 95% uh, commercial space and less than 5% residential, it ended up being 95% residential. So there's just these these empty buildings um, with uh, a need for individuals to be moving in in order for these real estate development uh, real estate development corporations to be able to return um, on their investment. So it's really about there being, uh, there's a large amount of weight behind uh, bringing individuals here into this space uh, that are being, that are the type of uh, consumers that will be able to um, help real estate developers make a return on their investment. So really what we're seeing is, uh, when we see that, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar now with, uh, there was a letter that, that was, uh, Made a year ago, where a lot of our politicians signed on to ask Amazon to come here, right? 
So there's this big pull, um, and there's this heavy amount of collaboration that we're seeing uh, between politicians at the city and the state level. Um, so this, when we see that happen, we have to recognize that that is happening because there's a huge amount of weight behind uh, bringing corporations that will gentrify Queens here. There's already so much weight behind it that it's it's like there's there's going to, our politicians are going to be lockstep on this. They're going to be all actively pushing this agenda, and that's why we see um, all of uh, all many of our politicians signing on to this. So <coughs> this has created kind of a very interesting situation, I think, for a lot of us uh, activists who are working around fighting gentrification, um, because. What ends up happening is we see, uh, we see with the announcement of Amazon, we see a lot of the individuals being like, that's terrible, Amazon's a, a terrible thing <laughs> in general, um, and we need to fight this. And so you'll see uh, lots of different groups and lots of different factions uh, you know, rise up and say, hey, like, we need to be fighting this. Um, and so, uh, when it comes to like how we like interact with this, you'll see also everything from uh, socialists um, by, who've been like very much on these lines combating these things, um, and you'll see uh, everything from there to like individuals who do different kind of uh, work in the community as nonprofits, and we see like an interesting play in relationships between them. So. One of the things I'm talking about is uh, we saw right away a, uh, a press conference and a, a rally with Jimmy Van Brammer and uh, Senator Giannaris um, coming out to say, hey, like, we oppose this thing, you know? And it, for a lot of people that creates kind of a, either confusion if they've, been, um, if they've been active in these spaces, but they don't necessarily understand some of the relationships at play. Um, and for others, it's very clear that that's exactly what's going to happen, and that uh, those who have any kind of financial ties or any kind of relationships to them are also going to help provide provide cover. You know, um, so okay. I feel like I, I had a very much a clear idea before I started speaking. Um, so when when it comes to like how we're going to be like engaging in this. It's just important that we recognize, okay, these are the relationships, and even if we're all, all on board with, uh, with saying that we're going to be opposing Amazon, it's important to understand these things because it will frame the way that that fight happens, yeah? So right now there's a big push to uh, kind of direct this fight into being a discussion around the deal, right? We know that uh, Amazon is being given billions of dollars, the largest handout that our state has ever given, um, to the uh, you know to the wealthiest person in the world. And um, you know when we hear things and hear people talking about trying to frame the conversation in terms of oh um, oh yeah in terms of uh, in terms of talking about like what the deal is. It's really a misdirection. So like, I think that it's super important that we think about, hey, like, how are we fighting this? And the way to fight this is, um, it is very clear. We've been given a model for fighting these kind of things before. We actually have to shift away from uh, discussions around us as a group of people, uh, organizing so that we ask someone of power to give us something. And we actually have to start figuring out what ways can we, as a group of people, organize so that we're in a position of power that we can make demands, that we can force things to happen? So, for instance, this is why, like, socialists very much love strikes, because it is a group of people saying to a, uh, a capitalist, we are going to shut your business down unless you give us what we want. Um, this is the type of organizing that we have to actually be doing if we want to stop Amazon from coming here. Um, and that's a very different conversation than trying to talk about, hey, what is the, what's the deal? How can we get something out of this? Because it's not about jobs. Um, 
you know, the average time that uh, engineers stay with Amazon is a year. So even if it was jobs that are intended for New Yorkers, it's, it's just this uh, fair belt, you know. It takes people in and it spits people out. So we can't really, even, even, if, even if we're guaranteed 25,000 jobs, we can't be thinking in those terms because there's, they're not jobs that are actually going to be for the community. It's not an entity that is actually like working in collaboration with the community. Um, and uh, I, I saw the two minute mark and I, I feel like I'm, I'm done. <laughs> we'll have more time during Q&A. Um, Our, our next speaker is um, Stefan Petrus. He's a historian here at um, the LaGuardia and Wagner Archives. And he's going to discuss the Amazon deal in the historical context. In the wake of New York City's fiscal crisis in 1975, municipal leaders embraced neoliberal policies that subsidized the expansion of the corporate and real estate sectors. And the Amazon deal is part of a deeply rooted policy that has the effect of widening income inequality, increasing real estate values for commercial and residential property, and reducing social services for the working class and the poor. It's going to give us the historical context. Thank you, Ariana. So great to be here, I'm really delighted. It's so nice to see uh, this turnout, really terrific energy. And as Ariana said, I, I want to put this, the Amazon deal in historical context. It's the move by New York State and city government to provide Amazon with nearly $3 billion in public funds is nothing new. This type of policy to expand the corporate sector at the expense of the public originated in New York just after the fiscal crisis of 1975. This particular case, of course, is highly visible due to the global prominence of Amazon and the size of the government subsidies, but again, it's not new. It's an example of neoliberal policy. Neoliberalism is an academic term, but I think it should be part of everyone's vocabulary. Um, if we're going to challenge this, we need to define it and understand its origins and how it evolved over time. So first I just, I want to uh, define the term neoliberalism, again refers to a series of economic principles that reduces taxes, that privatizes public services, establishes fiscal discipline, deregulates the private sector and encourages free trade and direct foreign investment. Basically, in short, neoliberalism reduces government spending in order to increase the role of the private sector in the economy and society. But neoliberal politicians in their speeches will say things like, you know, we need to create a business-friendly climate, uh, things of that nature. The effect of this type of policy on our society, basically it redistributes wealth upward and increases social inequality. In the United States, neoliberal policies since the 1970s create, has created a concentration of wealth among few families, a phenomenon that has not been seen in the United States since the Gilded Age, the period from the 1880s to the early 1900s. In the 2000s, the term the New Gilded Age was invented to characterize this new super wealthy class. Of course, Occupy Wall Street in the early 2010s and the Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016 represented challenges to this neoliberal policy. New York City was one of the first cities in the world to embrace this policy, again in 1975, when the business elites of New York, dissatisfied with the direction of the city and its political leadership, refused to continue lending the city government money and forced it into a technical bankruptcy. And this was the fiscal crisis of 1975. And this maneuver by the city's financial elites basically amounted to the overthrow of the elected government of the city. These financial elites in 1975 and thereafter used the fiscal crisis as a way to dictate their vision of New York. Who were these financial elites? Let's name them. They were men such as David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, William Salomon, managing partner of Salomon Brothers, Elmore Patterson, chairman of Morgan Guarantee Trust, Donald Regan, chairman of Merrill Lynch, 
John F. McGillicuddy, President of Manufacturers Hanover, William T. Spencer, President of First National City Bank, later Citibank. They formed in, in the late 70s the Financial Community Liaison Group in order to pressure political leaders in the city to make a series of economic reforms to serve their interests. Um, again, a lot of this happened under the radar. The names weren't familiar. They weren't part of everyone's vocabularies. But these were intense deals that were taking place behind the scenes. What did these financial elites want in the late 1970s? Basically, to shift the governance of New York. They wanted less government, less costly government, fiscal discipline, the reduction of social services and protections for the working class and the poor. They wanted to reduce the power of municipal unions. They wanted to reduce the benefits of government workers. What do they believe caused the city's fiscal crisis in the first place? They believe the causes were overly generous and misguided policies that subsidized working and middle class, such as rent control, public housing, subsidized middle-income housing, free public universities, CUNY, uh, inexpensive public health, excellent public employee benefits with, along with high wages. In response, they uh, established organizations that basically took over the city's budget and debt payment. New York's mayor at the time, Amy Beam, and the city council remained in office, but their power was greatly diminished. Ed Koch, elected in 1977, was the city's first neoliberal mayor, became a favorite of the financial community, indicated that his main priority would be to revitalize the city's economy by creating an, an administration to support the expansion of the business sector. The Koch administration attempted to lower the operating costs of city agencies through efficiency measures, tough negotiations with municipal unions, the replacement of higher paid workers with ones who were paid much less, um, after the city's recovery from the fiscal crisis in the early 80s, the, the government began to subsidize a real, ex real estate expansion of Manhattan through the building of offices and luxury condominiums. The city government also became involved in public-private partnership, such as the redevelopment of Times Square. So again, the private sector took an increased role in the governance of the city. Organizations like the uh, Central Park Conservancy, to maintain and manage Central Park, the Prospect Park Conservancy, business improvement districts to invest money in local neighborhoods to encourage consumption and gentrification. The redevelopment of Times Square. Um, in contrast, the city's poor suffered disproportionately from this upward redistribution of these resources during the Koch administration. Um, but again, uh, you know, entities such as AT&T, Rockefeller Center, Park Avenue, Trump Tower received tax breaks that amounted to hundreds of millions. Again, this, is, this policy goes back 40 years or so. The Giuliani administration in the 90s continued to provide tax benefits to corporations, let's name them, ABC, CBS, CS First Boston, Smith Barney, just to name a few. In return, these corporations promised to maintain their workforce in the city and, if possible, expand it. In many cases, these promises were not kept. Many of these jobs were held by people living outside the city in Westchester County, Long Island, and the suburbs of New Jersey. Moreover, the city government provided tax breaks for leases and renovations, mostly for office buildings in Manhattan. Policies, again, that continued, intensified dramatically during the tenure of Michael Bloomberg, a three-term mayor from 2001 to 2013. I won't get into too many details here, but a key change during the Bloomberg administration involved rezoning policies under City Planning Commissioner Amanda Burden. Roughly 40% of New York City was rezoned during the Bloomberg era. What's vital for us here at Long Island City is the transformation of the Brooklyn Queens waterfront on the East River. A change from a landscape of industrial structures, mostly warehouses and small factories, to a landscape of glossy condominiums and parkland. Here in Long Island City, the pivotal moment, 2001, I think Jonathan was referring to this, uh, rezoning in Long Island City from manufacturing to mixed-use developments um, resulted in landlords pushing out industrial tenants to take advantage of higher profits from residential and commercial development. At the time, city planning predicted only 400 units of housing would be built. In fact, 13,000 have been built. 95% are market rate luxury housing. Also, tax breaks for developers in Long Island City for some 20 years or so. Several 
uh, luxury towers pay no taxes thanks to the state program 421A. Again, let's name these programs. Again, you don't get much new co news coverage, 421A. Developers receive tax exemptions for at least 10 years in exchange for setting aside only 20% of their units as temporary so-called affordable housing. This program enriches luxury developers like Rock, Rock Rose at the cost of $1.4 billion in foregone taxes annually. Last, privatization of public land. Again, this is part of the neoliberal trend, privatizing public space. 2017, the city announced its decision to give away one of the largest parcels of publicly owned land in Long Island City to a private developer, let's say the name, TF Cornerstone, for the construction of nearly 1,000 units of mostly luxury housing. These government actions, in conclusion, illustrate that gentrification is not an inevitable phenomenon. Sometimes you just hear this, well, this is just progress, this is inevitable, this is just the nature of change. No, it's not. It is the result of a process of decisions being made, the process of basically reorienting the purpose of cities, of New York City, of Long Island City, from being spaces that provided for poor and middle classes towards spaces that generate capital for the rich. The Amazon deal is nothing new. Thank you. That was so thorough. Um, our next speaker is Bettina um, Damiani, is that right? Um, she teaches at CUNY School of Law of Labor and Urban Studies. In the last 13 years, she ran Good Jobs New York, um, a corporate subsidy accountability organization, and a project of J Good Jobs First. She's worked on projects like rebuilding Lower Manhattan after 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, and the um, Fresh Direct um, project in the Bronx. Um, I'm just going to talk about three things broadly. One is kind of put things in perspective, build off a little bit of what we were talking about before, what these deals really look like. And also some examples. These are not new in New York City. We talked about um, what are the ones that we all know about, and then some that actually didn't end up the way government wanted them to be, um, and then wind up hopefully with some optimistic news. So first of all, this economic forum on the states has been around for decades. And New York City has always been at the center of it. Because what do we love in New York? We love real estate, right? We love it. This is what fuels our economy, as many people in power will tell you. Um, but the reality is, is we don't have, to put on a little bit of an urban planning hat, there's really not many places we can go, right? We're gonna take over Yonkers. We're gonna like go over into Long Island. Our ability uh, to grow has to go up. We can't go out. So that means that space is at an absolute premium. And that gives a lot of power to folks that already own that property. So when we want companies to create good quality jobs, which we all do, including small businesses, we need to create an environment that they want to be here for. How many people think you've got really smart, brilliant people in New York City? We're looking right here, right at them. We want diverse, people that understand languages and different skills. Do we have that in New York City? Right? Do, we have, do we have a transportation system that needs help? Yes. Yeah. But do we have a good transportation system in New York City? These are the things that companies really care about. They don't care about whether they have to pay taxes at the end of the day. That's not where their costs really are. So what it does is it becomes to be a game, a game of the Rockefellers and the Morgans, right? And that what we need to do is hold those companies and government officials accountable. There often is a process for a voice for communities when projects like these are proposed. How many Met fans do we have in the room? I'm in Queens, come on, this is gonna be better than this. <laughs> Yankee fans? Yes. Oh no, there's more. <laughs> all right, so do you all know that both of those stadiums got billions of dollars of uh, our tax money mm -hmm. to build our new stadiums? Mm -hmm. They did. In the Bronx, they took over a public park mm -hmm. to build well, their new stadium, and then rebuilt where the park used to be where the old stadium was with AstroTurf mm -hmm. and parking garage. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is often these deals 
are done without community input. The law that allowed that to happen happened in the middle of the night in the state legislature. Fingers crossed that's not going to be happening in the future. But there are examples of how bad deals happen. And stadiums are one very good example. Then quickly also 9-11. 9-11 became Lower Manhattan is now a playground for very wealthy folks. Can you just go down there and buy a pair of shoes? No, it's all for very, very fancy folks and tourists. It wasn't built for us. Um, and then one more thing that I should mention is that the city court building over here got tens of millions of dollars of tax breaks to be built. And that's where I think the first group of workers from Amazon are going to be going. So, uh, and that was then in the Koch era. That was one of the bigger mega deals as we started. But I also want to say some positive things. So, two examples of where deals didn't go through. Um, and I'm not being naive in the fact that we know that this is a bigger deal than any of the others that we uh, have seen proposed. One being Kingsbridge Armory up in the Bronx. Mayor Bloomberg is part of this uh, attempt to sort of retailize all of New York with big boxes. Thought that this armory, which I don't know if any of you have seen, is actually a beautiful building. It's a historic building. One to make it to be a bunch of malls. Well, the small businesses in the area got together with unions and said, no, 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 you're not going to push us out and take subsidies. So they fought back the plan, and they won. There isn't a big mall there. And what happened in the second phase is the community got together and demanded a seat at the table. Now, that project's been uh, stalled, I would say, for political reasons, but in theory, there's supposed to be lots of the Kingsbridge Army ice rink is there. And there's been a community benefit agreement that would guarantee uh, jobs for folks and community space. One of the things I expect, there'll be a moment so I'll do this and be like, keep in mind when you hear this in the future. Somebody most likely will say, we're gonna have a community benefit agreement in exchange for all these subsidies. We promise we're gonna do A, B, and C. And that's beyond the 15 million that they said they're gonna do for the um, workforce development. The only way, I'm gonna call CBAs, work well is if you focus on the C. What's the C? Community. Community, right? The other ones in the city don't have the C. You are the C. And also, young folks, guys, you guys in college, this is your moment. This is the time to get together and focus. This is what really worked in all the other deals that were either changed or were or stopped. It's because young people got together and said, this is not what we expect for our community. This is not the future we want. So don't underestimate your role and know that there are going to be opportunities. It might not be the way they used to be. Normally there's public hearings for big deals like this. It's one of the things Josh was talking about before. Almost always was there an opportunity for a public hearing. The governor was extraordinary this time in using only something called as of right incentives, which means they don't have to be a public hearing. Almost all these big deals have discretionary money, which means they have to get the okay from a variety of, of uh, groups. So one of the challenges, force them into the public hearings. Find those loopholes and push the elected officials to have hearings and open up this process much, much more. So one of the, uh, one of the, my final note is, even though the dollar amount is extraordinary, right? I mean, depending who you talk to, it's either three billion, or four billion, it's billions of dollars, they really start to add up. Don't be surprised if there's more. There are industrial revenue bonds, it sounds like, and the government will tell you, the government meeting the city and state will say, you know what, we're gonna have something called industrial revenue bonds or private activity bonds, but that's not real money, so don't you worry. Well, worry, because Amazon and big companies wouldn't want these kinds of resources if there weren't ways for them to make money and for us to have to pay for it. So as this process goes on, keep in touch with the groups that are on the ground, the policy organizations, the unions, of finding out where your opportunity is to be engaged because there, there has to be. And that's because we have to make it be that way. Um, one more final thing, keep an eye on the New York State uh, Empire State Development Corporation, go to their website. They have a hearing every month. Maybe there's a deal that isn't as big as Amazon, but one that you care about. Or you want to see how this really works. This is the behind the closed doors that every now and then you get to get in front of. So 
be inspired. This is your moment. This is your neighborhood. This is your community. So go to those of us that have seen the history here and find out how to get more involved. Thank you. Our final speaker is Amy Herzog. Um, she's a professor of media studies at Queens College, and she'll be speaking about Amazon's central role in the cloud industrial complex, developing surveillance technology, large-scale data storage, and networking um, for ICE and DHS. I just wanted to mention that I am part of a small, uh, a small group of actually mostly community affiliated um, feminist and queer people who got together, um, a lot of us do media studies, and tried to figure out um, how, what we can kind of contribute to, to these campaigns. Uh, and we were really concerned about, a lot of us do sanctuary work um, through the community system, and we're concerned about the total lack of discussion of Amazon's relationship to ICE, that most of the um, political discussion has been about whether this is or is not a bad financial deal, um, as opposed to sort of asking like, well, what is the work that's being done by Amazon um, and how does that affect us? Um, and Amazon's relationship to, um, uh, to law enforcement, Department of Homeland Security and ICE is a hugely profitable and not terribly transparent process, um, and one that really affects people here at CUNY that has a disproportionate impact on immigrant communities, on communities of color, and on low-income communities. So Amazon makes billions of dollars from government contracts, and those are our public tax dollars for IT services. Um, and I just wanted to point it to, I passed around a handout. If you want to read more about this, I'm gonna kind of go through some highlights, but there's a fairly recent report um, commissioned by um, a Latinx uh, organization, Mi Gente. Um, the link is on the handout. Um, if you search for Mi Gente, um, No Tech for Ice, you'll be able to get the full 75 page report and it's kind of jaw dropping. Well, let me just talk about some of these technologies and how Amazon is profiting from this network. Um, one is their facial recognition technology that they launched in 2016, recognition. Um, and this is not my own dystopian rendering, this is actually how they advertise um, this, this technology. It's a cloud-based image analysis service. Um, and if you know anything about facial rec recognition technology, it's, there's a long history of imaging technologies used in policing, um, sort of operating on very flawed premises and systems of analyses that reinforce uh, racial biases. I'm happy to share more readings on this if you're interested. Amazon's own tech employees wrote an open letter um, to Jeff Bezos protesting the aggressive marketing of recognition and other web services to law enforcement and ICE. Um, basically coming right out and saying, we won't build this, this is immoral, this is unethical, we don't want to be forced to be complicit in this. Um, and Amazon um, not only didn't really respond to this, but in fact they doubled down um, and said that they were ready and willing to support the vital Homeland Security investigations um, missions and had some public, um, uh, public events uh, sort of recommitting themselves to doing law enforcement work. Um, the ACLU um, ran a few tests on the recognition system um, and uh, when they put through actually uh, 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 photographs of members of Congress, um, they found that there was a huge margin of error where many of our congressional representatives were falsely matched with mug shots and that there was a huge racial discrepancy in terms of the spatial recognition technology not being able to accurately scan the faces of people of color disproportionately um, getting false hits on this. Um, there are algorithms that can be run and tests that can be done to try to improve uh, and uh, try to structure out racial biases and Amazon refuses um, to do this. They're just 
continuing to market this technology. It's already being used by a number of um, municipal law enforcement agencies. And this is all part of a much larger network that Amazon Web Services um, has devoted to justice and public safety. And again, I didn't make this up. This is how they, how they are advertising um, to law enforcement. Um, Amazon has the largest number of federal authorizations of any technology company, which means that they have been vetted as um, secure and they can get government contracts. They have wow, okay, vastly way more than any organization. So this is, um, this is happening across the tech sector, but Amazon is far and away the leader, uh, the leader of, this, um, uh, of this organization. Um, and just on the back of the hand that I passed around um, from the uh, uh study, you can see kind of uh, mapped out the connections that um, Amazon provides basically the hub through which other partner companies, um, Palantir is one of the biggest ones, um, that the CEO and co-founder uh, Peter Thiel, who is a Trump advisor, um, um, they have uh, a software aggregate um, system called ICM um, that ICE uses to aggregate information from other partner agencies. So information from um, uh, the DEA, the FBI, personal and biometric information from other government agencies gets fed into these systems so it can get scanned. All of it is stored on AWS so these partner organizations can share, um, scan, and use that information to target um, persons, uh, persons of interest. Um, and I guess I just want to point this out because I, I'm not sure that people realize how much of our information, our biometric information, our personal information is being made available through these systems. Amazon is profiting from this already through government contracts. Um, and I'm quite concerned, as many other people are, about them handing over billions more of our tax dollars to support this work. So um, one of my questions is, what is a good job if we define the idea of a good job merely through the salary one makes, as opposed to asking, do we want to bring 25,000 more people here? Do we want to be training our CUNY students um, to aid ICE in more efficiently detaining immigrants or targeting communities of color? Um, I would say no, I do not think that's, um, that's a good job. I also think we, especially as a CUNY community, need to ask our politicians what they mean when they call New York a sanctuary city and then open up our budget to ICE's premier tech provider and invite them to move next door to us. Um, so. So, say thank you to our four wonderful speakers. I feel like they did a really good job of around down here. I'd love to have some students come down and ask questions in the 10 remaining minutes that we have. Come down to the mic because I think we're going to take two questions at a time and we'll go like that. Did everyone hear that? It was a question about like it was a question about Amazon's corporate culture and whether or not these are good jobs. So who would like to I feel like maybe Katina or... Yeah, I guess I already kind of um, showed showed my cards in terms of this, but I'm also a CUNY professor in media studies who um, kind of devoted my life to training students and helping that they um, are able to get jobs to try to work against the kind of segregation that's been happening. We want upper mobility. I guess I would just ask some ethical questions about um, what the impact of these jobs are on our communities. Is this the best organization um, for us to be supporting? 
does any organization need public dollars, in fact, um, to be coming here? So I think there needs to be a balance, and we certainly want human students to succeed. Um, but when there are such egregious ethical questions in terms of labor practices, um, and also no guarantees that these jobs are even going to CUNY students, it hasn't traditionally, um, um, there, there's no promises in place that that's actually going to happen. I think that this, um, this particular deal with this particular company, I don't see being a benefit um, to our students, but you do deserve to, um, to be trained for and uh, represented. I don't think that you're being represented well here. That's just my while, while you're answering, do, can we get some more people down to the mic? Thank you. By no means am I uh, encouraging or endorsing this, but if the Home Administration wanted to create and formulate this deal so it would do exactly that, hire folks from the community, from CUNY, they could have done that. Um, they could have put it in would already be in place. Right. The subsidy programs they chose to focus on doesn't require any of that. Could I say also like like there's the issue of like housing as well like um, you know like framing it as uh, like even even if like for any individuals like the employment uh, prospects is like nice like coming at the expense of like the removal of all of our communities is like that's not a, a worthy trade you know like. It, there, we can't say that, hey, like some people might get some some decent jobs. That's not worth uh, the displacement of communities all across Queens. So, I don't know. Okay, go ahead. We're going to take two questions now. Thank you, Professor. Um, my name is Sawan Sunny. Um, my major is Business Administration, Fall 2018. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the panel for coming here and to this event, taking part. Um, my question, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, my question would be like, um, coming from business background, I know that um, such a huge company coming to New York City has a huge rebuild effect, both positive and negative. And since we're here uh, discussing about the negative side, um, my question would be, um, how much effect are you know it will be it will put on the standard of living of uh, New York City um, citizens, especially students and. Uh, um, can you please elaborate any of the panels with please? Okay, second question, and then we'll take answers. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm not a student, um, but I'm wondering about sort of, who, <coughs> excuse me, who, who the coalition or who a, a set of allies might be in terms of, of fighting this, right? And what does that actually look like? Because it doesn't appear to me that, uh, that there's a ton of time. Um, and, and Bettina, I would push back a little bit you know, with sort of organized labor. I mean, 32 BKs already endorsed the deal because they get a contract. Um, you know, and, and I'm not sure organized labor is going to be. What's that? Our uh, W is here, that is correct. Um, yeah, but I'm also, so I want sort of the, the, the panel to start talking us through and the people to be thinking about sort of who are the allies in this fight and what does this look like? And one little plug to kind of bring in the environmental justice and sustainability folks because the site happens to actually be in a flood zone. Um, and the city is going to be moving a ton of infrastructural systems into a flood zone. Um, and okay. I haven't heard that. Okay, so let's get some answers. Um, so, James, 100% on the environment, actually my notes, but I didn't get to it, is nothing is scorned like an environmentalist, and I assume that this project will want to eventually develop into the river. Uh, that will trigger all kinds of angst from people and also um, some requirements for state engagement. So, yes to that. I'm not, I'll be honest with you. I think some of that of who's going to push us and who's going to be around is still evolving. Right? This is two weeks out. Um, yeah, Jonathan, do you want to talk about this? We're all here all so quickly, which is really good. That's part of the reason why we brought this teach-in together, right, is because we're thinking about these issues of who are the allies, who are the coalitions that can form around to push back against this. So I think that there's kind of, uh, there's kind of two groups. Uh, that we kind of see, um, and uh, obviously kind of a, a blend uh, between the, the two. Um, we have like 
uh, a group of, of the individuals who are kind of talking and framing it as the deal and trying to uh, push against it being a bad deal. Um, we have a lot of, there's a lot of nonprofits as well that are, are saying like, no, like we need to like say absolutely no to Amazon completely. And a lot of the fighting in those spaces kind of, uh, is kind of focused towards like, hey, how do we uh, approach things in the legal system? How do we approach things in terms of like pressuring our politicians? Which it is, is fine and that's going to be done. But I, I'm very much a, a proponent for uh, another group that is kind of like the other pole of finding this. There's a, a collection between DSA, um, Socialist Alternative, I see LG in the back, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, other uh, groups that are like that are completely non-funded because it's really important to understand that uh, we're the issue here is, is capitalism, and because of that, like we're not going to have anybody funding this fight. You know, it's actually like, really important to understand that because it really changes the way that we uh, see. The, the lens of who who we need to be allied with in order to actually truly like fight the problem at its root. Um, so there's yeah there's a, a collection of different uh, like non-funded um, community groups that are, like, are truly completely grassroots that we've kind of built a coalition with. Um, Queens Democratic United is one of them. Uh, yeah, Socialist Alternative DSA. Uh, Queen's Anti-Gentrification Project, and um, we're definitely looking for others who are like really interested in like things like, hey, like you know, we're going to need to like actually occupy space in order to prevent something from being built. Like that's the type of civil disobedience that we actually have to be engaging in if we want to challenge this. Um, it, it really is important to be understanding that uh, we have to be doing more than finding ways to ask people for permission. We have to be putting ourselves in a position where we're forcing something to happen. Okay, great. We're out of time. Thank our speakers again.